do when we're having those moments of despair? What do we do when we're doing everything that we possibly can? We're coming to church, we're tithing, we, we are praying, we are in our classes, we are deep in our spiritual disciplines, and yet we have those moments of chemicalization. We have those moments where the part of us that have grown comfortable with the issues that we are dealing with want to show up and convince us that we have no other place to go. That we, that we may as well stay right here in this place. That although it is not where we know we could be and know where we should be, at least it's a place that we know. And most people will choose a known hell before they accept an unknown heaven. I'm here to tell you today that what you think is a known hell, what appears to be despair and desperation, what appears to be difficulties and discouragement isn't that at all. It's not that at all. What it actually is is a Gethsemane experience. A Gethsemane experience. Gethsemane experience. Yes. Jesus had a Gethsemane experience and we have Gethsemane experiences as well. There are moments when we just have to walk through it. Yes. We have to walk through the garden of our Gethsemane. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Amen. Beneficent Spirit, Father, Mother, God, Creator of all, I pray that what you bring through me this morning blesses each and every individual in this sanctuary. Bless them in ways both expected and unexpected. Make ways out of no way for each and every one of us. My prayer is that this knowledge brings all of us into a knowingness. My prayer is that an understanding is ushered in with the experience of the spirit of truth. And now, work in us all, Lord. Let your presence abide mightily through the help of the Holy Spirit. We see it so. So it is, and so we are, in the name and in the consciousness of Christ Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. I want to go old school this morning, if I may. Can I go old school? Yes. And so if we're going to go old school, I'd like for everybody to take out their Bibles and turn to, oh, wait a minute. Some of us may not have Bibles. I see some of us do. That's good. If we're going to go old school, that means that we've got to look into this beautiful scripture for the knowledge, for the, the, the jewels that are within it. And that's okay if you don't have your Bible with you. I'm not mad at you. All right? And that all that means is that you've got to take this in with your heart. You've got to take this in with your ears. You've got the tools that you need in order to get this truth today. But if you do have your Bibles, then I want you to turn to the Gospel according to Mark, the 14th chapter. And we're going to work with the 32nd through the 41st verse. The 32nd through the 41st verse. That's Mark 14, verses 32 to 41. You might want to write that down if you don't have your Bible so that when you get home, you can pull it off the shelf and you can go through it and learn this truth, it will help you to know the truth that can set you free. Yes. It's going to allow you to see things as they truly are. For the scripture says, judge not by appearances, amen, yes. but judge with righteous judgment. Yes. And so this is the pericope of scripture whereby we see Jesus 
in his Gethsemane experience. And I want to read this for you and then share with you some not so old school things. Well, I say it's not so old school, but in actuality, it's ancient wisdom. Amen. So it's older than we think. Many people say new thoughts, not so new. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Here's how it reads. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It says, They went to a place called Gethsemane. Say Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. Amen. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, Are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into this time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, What? Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. Let the church say amen. amen. When we look at scripture, it is up to us to interpret what it is saying to us. In many churches, they say that there's only one way to interpret the scripture, and that is word for word. However, if they were to do a little bit of homework, if they were to just go a little bit deeper into the history of biblical interpre interpretation, they would see that there are myriads of ways in which the Bible can be, and all scripture can be, interpreted. I'm going to give you eight ways right now. You can interpret the scripture literally and historically. Mindfully and morally, allegorically spiritual, mystical, and metaphysically. <laughs> Let me go back to it. Repeat after me. Literally and historically. Literally and historically. Mindfully and morally. Mindfully and morally. Allegorically. Allegorically. Spiritually, mystically, and metaphysically. Spiritually, mystically, and metaphysically. All right, try to say that three times back. <laughs> now, there are categories of interpretation, for we are working with different dimensions of our being. As you well know, Transforming Love Community, that we are spirit, soul, body. And so, if you are working with the body, we may look at the scriptures and interpret them literally and historically on the surface. Amen? But if we want to go a little bit higher, we might go mentally with it or soulfully with the scriptures and interpret them mindfully and morally and allegorically. In other words, what are the lessons to be learned in this scripture? Are you with me thus far? Amen. But there, good, better, best, there's a better, best yet, and I'll work until my good is better and my better is best. There's a higher, best yet, and that is 
the spiritual yes. interpretation of the scriptures. And in that category, you see interpretation that comes out of the spiritual, out of the mystical, out of the metaphysical, the study or systematic study of the science of being, as Charles Fillmore would say. In other words, you're now looking at this interpretation of the scripture and saying, reflecting, what is it saying to me about how things come into being? Do you see? So literally and historically, mindfully and morally, allegorically, spiritually, mystically, and metaphysically. Amen? All right. I just keep saying it over and over again until you write it down because I don't want you to forget. Amen? Amen. And so let's start with the literal and historical. I'm not going to go through it all, but you've got the elements so that when you study the scriptures, you can look at it in these ways. Amen? Amen. All right. So literally and historically, we look at Jesus' experience of Gethsemane. And we can look at the history behind the locality. That locality is very important. For we see a garden. And it is a garden of olive trees. That are at the base of a mountain called Mount Olive. Are you with me thus far? That's very important to note. It's a historical element of this story that will factor as we go higher up in our interpretation. Are you with me? Yes. So let's put that to the side and go a little bit higher. <laughs> Look at this wonderful scripture, mindfully, morally, and allegorically. When we look at that, we're looking at the morals of the story and we can see some serious things going on. We can see that the moral of this story could be, don't fall asleep. For we see several of the disciples falling asleep on Jesus. Peter falls asleep, James falls asleep, John falls asleep. As they are praying, as Jesus is in his hour of need, Someone told me that when he was crying, he was crying tears of blood. Of course, that's, a, that's symbolic. It was saying that he was in distress. We never see Jesus in distress. But Jesus was human. Yes. He was not only the Son of God, but also the Son of Man. Amen. And so this is how we can relate to him. Because what he grows through, we also are going and yes. growing through. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus is having a moment. Anyone have a moment? <laughs> all right, you don't have to raise your hands. It's all right. I think I've got my ass. <laughs> and he is working through this moment. And he's working hard at this moment. Because something is about to pop. Something is about to jump. He understands this, but it's still, he still has the emotions, he still has the feelings of a human. That's a good thing. Because what it's telling us is that when we have those similar feelings, that there may be something that we too can do. And so, he goes and he comes back and he sees the disciples asleep. And he goes and he comes back again and he sees the disciples still asleep. And he goes and he comes back and he says, oh, enough. <laughs> Perhaps the moral of this story is that nobody can grow through the Garden of Gethsemane for you. You have to do it alone. But the good news is that you're never alone. Amen. And this takes us a little higher in our interpretation. 
spiritually, mystically. 